influence the United States, and now lives his passion of enabling junior athletes to evolve into the people and players they desire to be every day. With his father as an elite level rugby coach, and Ian having played a number of junior sports and collegiate level rugby, he's formulated an eclectic mental performance program that he believes will help players experience freedom, flow, and fun in competition. Today he shares his ideas on what a junior golfer needs to evolve as a player in person. Ian Highfield. So, I'm going to open up with three facts about myself. The first one, I'm obsessed with elite performance. It's a topic I've studied now for around about 10 years. The second fact, I love golf. I think it's one of the best, if not the best sport in the world. And the final fact is that I get absolute fulfillment from helping children learn and grow and become the best they can be. So, it's really fitting that my current role is the Director of Mental Performance at Bishopsgate Golf Academy. What I want to share with you guys today is the, the knowledge and the experience that I've picked up over the last 10 years uh, and hopefully give you some take-homes and some ideas of what a junior golfer needs to evolve as a player okay, cool. and a person. So, what does a junior golfer need? Let's dive in and answer the question straight away. And I want to try and do this with a vision, a vision analogy. I believe that the junior golfer needs the correct environment. And I want you to picture, imagine this glass is your golf academy. Imagine the water inside is like all your players, and imagine that this bottle of colouring is your golfing philosophy. Whatever you put out into the environment in any way, shape, or form, it spreads. So I think this gives a very powerful image of what a role of a, a golf coach is. It's not necessarily to instruct an individual, it's to create an environment where individuals can learn and grow. An environment that helps individuals flourish and be the best they can be. So, what does the philosophy need to contain? How do we create this environment? Well, at Bishopsgate, every day, myself, Kevin, all the coaches, we really want to educate our students on why they're doing what they're doing, why they need to change. So I think the foundation is education. Next, we need to create an inspirational environment. If we don't inspire these junior athletes to make change, if we don't help them discover their compelling reason to take action, then the education only remains as information. It never actually gets action. So, education, inspiration, and finally, application. At Bishopsgate, myself and a number of the coaches, we really want the students to apply what they're learning. And believe it or not, we want them to fail. We want them to fail, embrace failure, and then learn from that. So, we really try and set up an environment that encourages the students to try new things and learn and grow from these experiences. So that's the overall philosophy. Well, what does this educational, inspirational, and applicational environment need to fuel? And I'm going to cover now with everyone in the room three things that I believe. The first one, I truly believe we have to create an environment that enables a growth mindset. So a mindset can be defined as a self-perception or self-theory that someone holds about themselves. A growth mindset would be a self-perception or a self-theory that, okay, where I am today does not dictate who I will be tomorrow. 
And we're, we're working what we're talking about junior involvement in children. So, a school analogy. If you have a student who isn't very good at mathematics, and they truly believe that that's how it's going to be forever, I'm not very good at maths, that's an example of a fixed mindset. If the student believes, with grit, effort, hard work, focus, that one day they can make the shift from being poor at maths to being good, that's an example of a growth mindset. And I think this is the cornerstone of, of what we're trying to create at Bishop's Gate. We really want our students to have a growth mindset and know if they put the effort in, the results will start to come. So, how do we do this, or how do I do this? Well, one of the tools I use to create an environment that, that fuels a growth mindset would be the way I use social media. And I make the utmost effort to always praise effort before outcome. <clears throat> At this point, I want to stress, this isn't my research. I'm taking the work of people far cleverer than me. Um, I'm going to make reference to clinical psychologists, I'm going to make reference to educators and researchers. In the field of sports psychology, I would be what you would call a performance coach or a, or a mental trainer. So I'm actually studying other people's research and, and just trying to put it into a framework. But I've seen great results with this. So Carol Dweck, Mindset, that's a great book that always talks about praising effort before outcome. And Changing the Game in Youth Sports, John O'Sullivan. I've referenced them right at the bottom of the slide. I'm sure Lauren will make all of these available so you guys don't have to scribble all the, the references down. You'll, you'll get them at the end. But these guys really confirm that by praising effort before outcome, you're going to enable students to learn and grow. So how do I do this on social media? So you can see here, these are two posts that I made when I was at an IJGT event at Crescent Point. And the first one, it really talks about people bouncing back, people battling, people putting effort in. The second one is all encapsulated. That's everyone who went to that tournament. Everyone's involved, everyone's part of the team. And again, it's praising how everyone represented the academy both on and off the courts. There was a student at this tournament, 13 years old, played in the under 18s category, shot minus three on the final day to finish third. It would have been really easy for me to make my posts all about him. Picture of the trophy and try and, I guess, promote the academy in that way. However, I feel the danger of that is maybe that can fix that student mindset. If we talk about how good he is, he might start to believe it and then there could be a, a diminishing effort made in practice. And also, what about all the other students? They could start to develop a why bother mindset because they're never included in any of the social media or any of the praise. It only goes to the people who are winning not the people who are putting in the effort. So the first way that myself and people at Mission Escape really try and fuel a growth mindset is praising effort before outcome, and we use social media as a tool to do that. A uh, second way, the creation of vision boards. So I'm sure a number of you in this room are familiar with the book The Secret, written by Ron Laverne. And it talks a lot about ask, believe, receive. And put a picture up, let that picture manifest in your mind, and eventually it will come to you. Which is great to a point, but at Bishop's Gate, the real goal that I try to create is take it beyond that. Take it beyond what do you want, and really tap into students' intrinsic motivation. When you tap into a, a student's intrinsic motivation, some of the, the things that the kids will come out with, it blows your mind. So I'm going to give you a worked example now of, of how I put this process into play. So I have a student, amazing young man, wants to win 19 majors. Cool, who am I to say that that's not going to happen? 
So that's great, but if you're going to make that come true, we need a little bit more. So how? How are you going to win 19 majors? Okay, I'm going to put 100% effort in everything I do every day. He's terrible at keeping stats. He hates keeping stats. So really, that's what he's making a reference to there. Keeping his practice stats and keeping his performance stats. And he knows if he does that, and it's maybe the small things that these students don't often value that they'll come up with. He knows if he does that, he's a step closer to those 19 majors. Okay, so we have what you want. You have a plan, a process in place to how you're going to get it. Tell me why. Why do you want that? Well, you know, I'm, I'm from a poor background. My parents aren't as affluent as many people in the academy, and they've made huge sacrifices for me to be here. So he wants to retain them. Okay, great. What else? Really tapping into the intrinsic motivation. And, it, and it's a skill to do this. It takes time to learn. Finally, we get to the source. Okay, I want to pay back my country. So this student at 13 years old is saying, I'm from South Africa. I've seen poor people not be able to eat. When I win 19 majors, I'm going to start a charity, I'm going to start a foundation, I'm going to feed my country. And to me that's incredible, we've really gone beyond the norm of just asking the student, okay, what do you want? We've put a process in place, what, how, and why. And the most amazing thing, or one of the most amazing sites you'll see at Bishop's Day, is this, the students actually take them to practice. So we give them little metal frames or they put dots and they can hang it over the lime rods and they'll put them in the floor. And when you walk down the range, there's a group of eight students, all with these vision boards lined up, it creates a really powerful, intrinsically motivating environment. The best thing for a coach, as soon as the student isn't focusing, walk by, point at the board, they don't even have to say anything. Back on it, 100% focus, because you're not helping them with what they want, you're helping them with why they're doing it. You're helping them with something bigger than this, themselves, a deeper meaning or a deeper purpose. Further sources, start with the why by Simon Sinek, might be one of the most powerful TED Talks that I've seen. It's based on business, but that really helps you understand this process. A great book written by Joshua Metcalf called Burn Your Goals. That source is The Dangers of Goal Setting and Drive by Dan Pink. So I guess I've studied what these really clever people have done and brought it all together in a really simple way to tap into students' intrinsic motivation. And goal setting is a real, you know, I guess boring topic for, for some students. They don't like to engage in it. If we do it like this, you, you get a different vibe about it and engage a bit more. Okay, finally, the, the final tool that I want to share with you guys on how to create a growth mindset environment is challenge the students. So, I don't, when, when I'm coaching, I don't want it to be about me, I want it to be about the students. So, I'll give the students challenges to go away with take into different environments. They won't always be doing this at the academy, they might be doing it at school, they might be doing it at home. We do a little challenge called Thought Tracker. And really simply, when a student has negative thoughts, they put red dots in the squares. When a student has positive thoughts, they'll put green dots into the squares. And it starts to give the student awareness of how their brain works, awareness of patterns that they're looking so, a student now sees, okay, I have this many positive thoughts, I have this many negative thoughts. They also see if they run patterns on the golf course, some, this will happen, and all my thoughts will go red. And the amazing thing, when you begin to challenge students in this way, they start to make the interventions themselves. I had a student who did this, he brought me his sheet, he had 12 red dots before he'd even got out of bed. That was a concern to me. It was an even bigger concern to him. And he told me, don't worry Ian, I've already put three words on my alarm clock 
for when I wake up tomorrow morning. Wow, great. I didn't even do a thing. I set a challenge and he responded to the challenge. So when students begin to make their own interventions through us creating the right environment, I believe you know that's a great example of, of what coaching is and what a coach's role should be. So a little fact about this, or a bit of data, maybe my own research, if you like. The first time I did this, I did this with five students. Every single student beat their score in average in the following tournament, and every single student, more, important, more importantly, reported having more form on the golf course. And that's the big thing for me. So, we really are giving students awareness of their thoughts, and I see it like a roadmap. As coaches, we know we want students to be more positive, we know we want them to have more energy on the golf course and then think in a correct way. And we share this with them. But what was, the, what was the starting point? We often give them the destination, but what was the starting point on the map? At times, we don't give them the starting point. And I really feel that's what Thought Tracker does. It's like the pin in the map. This is where you're at, and this is where we want to take you. And when you're given that destination, it really allows you to move in the right direction. Reading I would recommend on this would be a book that was recommended to me by Dr. Rob Neal, so from a, from a very credible source, called How Children Succeed by Paul Tuff. And he talks a lot about a process called metacognition. That word was far too complex for me to really try and talk about, but it's cognition about cognition, or knowing about knowing, ultimately understanding your thoughts. And I think if you read that, you'll see the power and benefits that Thought Tracker can, can provide to your students. Okay, so we've covered the three tools that I would implement and, and other staff at Bishop's Gate Golf Academy would implement to create a growth mindset. But what else do we need to fuel? What else do we have to educate, inspire, and allow children to apply? Well, we have to enable them to learn a process called chunking. This is, this is very important, this is a real, real big one. Chunking can be defined as a flexible way of learning. We, we develop the ability to collect elements that have an association with each other and make a decision. That's the definition. A really simple analogy would be at some point today, I'm sure everyone in this room has walked through a door. So as we're walking up to the door, our brain is doing a scan, it's looking at all the elements, and then it chunks them all together. And guess what? We know whether to push or pull. We know if we're going to put our Starbucks coffee under our armpit here. We know if we have to take a big step. And you do it without really knowing because you've walked through doors lots of times in your life and you develop the ability to chunk information. Unfortunately, for a number of junior golfers, the way they practice really does not enable chunking to evolve. So we have a, a traditional setup here on the left-hand side, as everyone in the room looks at the screen. And really that encourages students to rake and hit balls. They stand in the same spot, they pull one with their club, they hit it. Stand in the same spot, pull one hit, rake, hit. And after a certain number of balls, that's going to become a physical act. It's not going to become a learning process. So, to encourage an environment that enables chunking, we can change the way we set up the range slightly. So, real simple change pull the pyramid back, add a note pad, a whiteboard, or a pen. And have the hitting bay where it was. And this allows a student, there's more space, they have the ball to put down. This allows a student to pee, plan the shot, and now put your plan into place. They then act upon this plan, and on the way back to get their next ball, there's time for reflection and even time to record. You can record your learnings. So, a real simple change to the practice environment can enable this process called chunking, and one that I would strongly 
strongly recommend. Again, reference to practice. Make practice competitive. Uh, since Kevin has come on board at, at Bishop's Day, it's something we've really, really started to, to drill into. Create <coughs> an environment of competition. So when our students are doing skills challenges, they're not just going to report to the coach, oh yeah, par 18, 3 and leave. There's going to be a scorecard in hand, there might be leaderboards, and there's going to be consequences for the losers, sometimes prizes for the winners. Kids like nothing more than, okay, if you shoot this score, I'll do your 10 hill runs. If you miss this score, you're going to do your 10 hill runs. They know nothing more than seeing me running up and down a hill with my hands up in my head shouting, I'm, I suck at coaching or whatever. But that represents God, because guess what we've done? We've made it important to them. All too often, junior golfers, practice isn't important, they don't go through emotions. Then they get to a golf tournament, and it is important. That's the wrong way around. Practice needs to be as important, if not more important, than the competition. So, make, make practice competitive, have winners, have losers, and what happens is, students start to develop coping strategies, they start to go through something in practice that recreates and simulates what they're going to face in tournament play. When they're then in tournaments, practice had a purpose and they can now recall on their experiences, or chalk if you like, and perform better. A great source for this one would be uh, Game Like Training by Matthew Cook. He actually does packs where you can get the scorecards, the games, everything all together in like a one-stop shop. Uh, he also has a lot of information on par practice in it, so that's a source I'd recommend from that. Finally, with regard to helping students chunk and create an environment, would be extreme practice. So my source for this is the Navy Seals. Sounds a little extreme when we're talking about junior golf. I'm not going to ask a student to sit in a bed for seven days and get by on one hour of sleep. That would be a little crazy. But the theory behind it is the same. Let's make practice harder than competition. If practice is harder than competition, when you stand on that first tee and you look the other players in the face, you know that you have, they haven't practiced as hard as you. You know you have a mental edge. And you can see the picture, you'd be forgiven for thinking that Tristan's maybe just won one of his 19 majors. This is in practice. <coughs> this is in practice. And he's just hold a four foot pole to progress to the next hole. That's all he's done. The game, well, we've been playing a number of games. The, the, the secret with this is to actually hit the sweet spot. Don't make the game too hard so that everyone completely fails shatters their confidence, but they, it does need to be set at a sweet spot where they might fail the first two or three times and it's, it's a challenge for them. And the game we play, we, we created a game uh, called Par to Progress. So if a student pars the hole, they progress to the next hole. Really simple. If they make a bogey, they go back to the team. If they make a double bogey, they'll go back to the previous, and so on. The twist, they have to draw every second pot back four feet. So now, a student hits a nice drive, centre of the fairway, they hit a shot at 15 feet from 150, so PGA tour average there. They're relatively happy, they pot, and the pot shaves the hole, goes a couple of inches by. They now have to draw the pot back four foot. So in their mind, they've played awesome golf and they're now faced with this four-footer just to progress to the next hole. If they miss that, all the way back to the tee. So that does two things. That develops the ability to, to chunk, which you experience to chunk if you start holding the pots. Great for tournament golf. If you miss, that walk back to the tee is a lonely walk. You have a choice. You can try and know, like 
and our junior golfers, and you can repeat that process. Or you can self-organize and begin to change your physiology, begin to change your self-talk. And students will do that eventually. They'll get sick of going back to the T or back to T's. So they'll actively discover what they need to do to deal with disappointment on the golf course. The source for that, the YouTube link below, uh, my YouTube channel is called Osvea TV, O-S-V-E-A TV. You'll see that video in full up there, basically explaining that game and, and how it works, and a little bit of information on extreme practice. So, we talked about tools to create a growth mindset. We talked about tools to, or changes in practice, to enable students to chunk. One more factor that my journey has led me to believe is vital for the environment that a junior golfer is exposed to. And something we need to educate, inspire, and let golfers live and feel and apply in, in their training. And that's of automation. So, automation can be defined as a non-conscious act. Again, I'm, I'm not really the, the guy for definition stories or analogies. So there was a study done on the Brazilian soccer star Neymar. They scanned his brain while he was playing. They scanned the number, number of amateur soccer players while they were playing. They compared and contrasted the results. Neymar showed 10% of the cognition of an amateur soccer player. 10%. In effect, his mind was quiet. He was in state, however you, you want to put it. What we use at, at Vicious Game to enable students to feel what it's like to be free and flowing when on the golf course is what I like to call transition training. Um, rather than me trying to show you guys, I've put together a two minute video that shows a number of the drills. So this will play through and then We'll discuss it afterwards. I hope you enjoy. There's not a link. Oh, there it is.
he did transition training that game and a, and a lot of other challenges that involved putting for a few weeks. And I began to see that he was more automated, less conscious action when he was putting. And we began open questioning. Okay, Tom, what are you feeling? Well, actually, everything's fast, so I need to feel slow. My walk to the ball is slow. My feet are soft on the floor. My hands are soft. The stroke and rhythm is slow. Okay, cool. We put him back on Sam put that, and he changed his data. He changed two numbers. He changed the tempo of the stroke, the, the graphs, they married up more. There was less dispersion between the tempo and the stroke. And the actual overall consistency number changed, which obviously it wasn't. So I didn't tell him, you're thinking too much, you need to think less, you know, soften it up. I put him in a situation, I created an environment where he discovered that for himself. Another example, the golf suicide. So you saw the one where he was running and he would give me a high five. This is designed to replicate the physiology a golfer will go through when under pressure on the golf course. Now, it's important that I stress to you guys, all of those videos that are on the golf range, when we take this kind of training to the course, we want to maximize retention and transfer of these skills. So eventually, you're going to have to start performing them in the environment that golf tournaments are. So you can see level one, no target. Level two, we introduce the target. Level three, random. So we move from a block system to a random system, all the way until we're on the golf course playing speed golf. Now this student made a birdie on the hardest hole at Bishop's Gate Golf Academy in two minutes, 24 seconds. So that was my window. Okay, let's find out what he did, and let's transfer that to competition. So we spoke a lot, and he talked about, because he was racing against the clock, he knew he couldn't make five or six practice swings. Because he was feeling pressure, he really wanted to take everything away and focus on his practice swing. So he decided to close his eyes and make one rhythmical practice swing. Great. He also said he needed to breathe more because he was out of breath. Which again, under pressure is a great thing to do. And the simple swing thought was carry the feelings of the practice swing into the shot. So again, the environment allowed him to create his own zone. I wasn't there to tell him, you need a more purposeful practice swing. Perhaps close your eyes, you'll feel it, let you feel it more. The environment allowed him to self-discover this. And then, what else is key is making students accountable. So, this is a scorecard, and this helps develop or maintain automation. What we find, we wire. We are what we repeatedly do. So, I want to hold students accountable for these processes that they discover. So, the O stands for options, the S stands for selection, V stands for visualization, E for execution, and A for acceptance. And my studies, Basically, just watching the PGA Tour, you watch Jordan Speed, you watch Jason Day, they seem to tick all of these boxes when they play. They're not two bad guys to model. So, I want the students to look at five components of a golf shot, not just the one they normally look at, which is the swing. So, then he will fill this scorecard in. So, visualization process close eyes, feel the practice swing, execution process. Breathe on the walk to the ball, recreate the practice swing. And then, while he's, now he's transitioning, that's why it's called transition training, he's transitioning what he's discovered in the, the environment that allows you to, he's transitioning onto the golf course and using it as a performance tool, using it to stay process focused. And after every hole, or after every shot, he'll grade how well he stuck to his processes. So, as well as creating automation, by making students accountable, we create process-focused golfers, which is a, a very, very powerful tool if you want to become a leader. Okay, so, um, as I said, this is, this is my journey. 
And I've done a lot of studying, a lot of research, and six years coaching in junior golf now. Prior to that, I had about six or seven years there was an overlap working in business and sales psychology. So why have I picked education, inspiration, and application? And why have I picked growth mindset, chunking, and automation? And I've picked it because, like I said, you watch the top guys on the PGA Tour, they all have a growth mindset. Jordan Spieth's a great example, Jason Day's a great example. Growth mindsets, they all believe that they can improve. They all believe with effort, grit, determination, they'll get better. Chunking, they make great decisions. The conversations that you hear on some of the coverage between caddy and between golfer, they're discussing their options, they're discussing what they're going to select. They're actually chunking information. That's what they're doing at that point, they're chunking. And when they hit the ball, the ones you've heard Tiger Woods talk about, he blacked out. There you go, he's in an automated state, there's less cognition. So these habits, wiring these habits, are very powerful for students who want to go and play the PGA Tour. Some of the business consulting I did was in medical sales. I used to be lucky enough to go and watch surgeons do operations. And guess what? If you want to be a surgeon, you have to have a growth mindset. You have to be able to chunk back on previous experiences. And in that moment, when you're trying to save someone's life, you have to be automated. The surgeons will listen to rock music while they're performing operations in an attempt to get in that automated state. If you want to be an artist, you have to have a growth mindset, you have to believe you can do it, you have to believe anything's possible, you have to be able to chunk, and then when they're in full flow, they're automated. So I truly believe that the framework that I'm creating from looking at this, these clever people's research and studying Rates in their field is creating habits not just that junior golfers can take into competition, it's creating habits that junior golfers can take into life, whatever they choose to be. So, again, my journey leads me to believe the first port of call as coaches, we have to realize maybe the days of instructing the individual or coaching an individual have gone, and the most powerful tool that we can create is an environment. Because the environment involves parents, the environment involves friends, the environment involves everyone. Okay? So, maybe don't focus so much on the individual, focus on the environment that you create when those individuals arrive. Students, when they've had a lesson, they'll go and talk about it. So you're, you're coaching one individual, Bishop's game, we go out on the range of the weekend, there's five or six students like that all filming each other, giving each other lessons. So we need to be aware that the information that's being put on it isn't direct instruction, it's creating an environment. The environment, in my opinion, from my studies, should be educational, inspirational, and applicational. And we should really be trying to fuel growth mindset, chunking, and automation. The language that we use is extremely important. Praising effort over outcome will help create the environment we need for junior golfers to be the best they can be. Social media, the tool I guess that I use to, to try and fuel this. Challenge active discovery. So it doesn't take a genius to work out that I'm really big into constraints that learning. I do believe children can self-organize and teach themselves. And, and that really is the foundation of, of the program. But don't be afraid to instruct. There are students that won't self-organize as quickly as their friends. There are some students that just don't get it. So starting with a constrained environment, I believe it opens windows to coaching. You can go in and ask open questions. I also believe asking the open questions and relaying back to the field, then maybe opens windows for instruction. So it, it, there's like a flow to it for me. But don't just think it's all active discovery. I think sometimes in the golf industry you can 
get at that theory or a philosophy and just completely run with it. Yes, I love to challenge students in active discovery, but at the right times, I'm not afraid to go in and do it. The practice environment is vital. The way the, the, the learning process, and, or the lack of learning process, the students when they practice is, is perceived as a complicated problem, and it is. But look at the solutions that are posted, they're very simple. So often simple solutions to complex problems really work. Just pull the pyramid back, give the student the scorecards so they have to write down their scores in practice rather than you know, not have any accountability. Make the students accountable, as I said, with the scorecard, and as I said, with the process goal scorecard. So once the students actively discovered what they think they need to bring the zone to them, we don't want to, as golfers, we don't want to wait for that day when it just hits. Let's try and recreate it. And by making students accountable and holding them to a process where they have to score the feelings of flow and freedom that they assess, it really helps why a habit. It really means that they're not just going to do it when you're there. If you're going to ask to see the sheets, they take these sheets home when they go and play, do they score their process goals? So make students accountable. And finally, I haven't mentioned this in the throughout the presentation, but I hope to you guys it was obvious, fun. This is all about junior golf. I love helping children learn and grow. Let's make it fun. Let's engage the student. If it's not fun, guess what? They're not going to want to do it. They're going to want to drop out. So make it fun, and then at the right time, start adding this intensity. You know, I, I can't, I don't know all the stats, but I don't know them way better than me on the dropout rates in junior golf. But the game is certainly not growing. I feel a framework like this, a coaching program like this, because it's fun, students want to do it. They don't necessarily want to stand and practice their hinge for five hours. It's part of the game, and it needs to be done, absolutely. But it's only a small part. So really make it fun for students, and then engage. And when they engage, as I've said, we're trying to create hardwired habits that won't just serve them as PGA Tour or collegiate golfers. They'll serve them in whatever they choose to, to do in their lives. So that's me, my journey, my education, all from my paradigm. Uh, I, I don't know how long I've talked for, but if there's time, I'd love to field any questions if you guys have them.